Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Paul. Uh, this should be a very different kind of webinar, so I'm excited to, uh, to get into this with these guys. The guys that are joining me today have been in hundreds, maybe even over a thousand shops collectively, um, with the four of us. And we've seen a lot of good and a lot of bad practices, a lot of waste, a lot of things that a lot of shops do wrong. So before we dig into that, let's cover some of the housekeeping. There is a Q&A uh, panel on the side of your screen probably. Um, so if you do have questions, please go ahead, uh, put those in the, in the, in the Q&A section, and we will get to those at the end of the webinar. Um, so you are all muted, of course, as is standard practice. So uh, yeah, use that Q&A, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so Jason, let's start off with you. This was your brainchild. Tell us why we're all here today. <clears throat> Well, for the few people who don't know who I am, I'm Jason Koger. I'm the local Mastercam guy. I sell and support the software. And um, my background's a pretty good one. I grew up machining, programming. I flipped the floor, worked my way through the ranks, then back to janitor, and now ultimately wound up here. So um, it, it's good for you guys because I'm I'm from the trenches. Uh, and we're the things we're going to cover today, we've actually implemented in different shops. You know, um, like Paul said, I've been in hundreds of shops, you know, with the rest of the guys on the panel. And um, usually it's to go in and solve a problem, you know, make my part run faster. Well, there's almost always a bigger problem in the process. You know, we see a lot of the same waste shop after shop. And, um, you know, it's not always a cycle time that we can improve that could increase the profitability, but looking at the whole value stream from start to finish. So um, today's webinar, we're gonna cover what kind of waste we see in the different departments of the of the machine shop? We're going to cover uh, how to give you. We're going to cover giving you solutions for that, and then we're going to take a look at what the future state could look like. So um, let's everybody introduce ourselves, and then we'll we'll dive in, right? All right, sounds good. I'll go first. So um, I used to also sweep floors in a machine shop, Jason. Um, I actually was a shop owner for about 17 years. Started a shop right out of college. I was a machinist and a programmer, an estimator, floor sweeper, of course. And during the time we ran our shop, we actually built some software to help run our company. Um, grew that, that shop up to about 75 people and then eventually sold it and went full time into the software business. And so now we work with shops all around the world uh, to help their, make their processes more lean and get more done with less effort. How about you, Brian? Tell us about yourself. Well, unfortunately, I haven't swept very many shops. Um, I, I would be willing to, but it's just it's not my background. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Jacobs. I'm from CG Tech. CG Tech is the developer of Vericut software. Um, Vericut is software to simulate, verify, and optimize NC code. So we're simulating CNC machines. Um, the company has been in business for 32 years. I've been part of the company a little bit more than half of that. Um, in my current role, I cover the Pacific Northwest, and I am also the Boeing Global Account Manager for CG Tech. Um, so that's about it. Uh, Brandon? Yeah, so I, uh, my name is Brandon. I represent Verisurf Software. So we are different than Vericut, very commonly confused. We got the four first uh, letters, but we're totally two separate companies. But um, So we're a 3D uh, metrology inspection and reverse engineering software. We work with over 150 devices. Anywhere from, say, small scale medical to very large scale aerospace, we cover it all. We interface with a bunch of devices. Uh, I've been with Veris for about three years and uh, about five years of metrology experience working with a yeah, wide range of different applications. So I'm happy to be here. Right on. <clears throat> okay, thanks, guys. So before we really dig into things, let's start by talking about just kind of the main points, what we look for when we walk into a shop maybe top three or four things, and then we'll dig into more detail. So I, when I walk into a shop, the first thing I look for is paper. I look for piles of paper on desks. I look for job travelers. If I see that, I know there's a ton of waste out there. There are people waiting for jobs they don't realize they have to work on. Uh, there might be things not getting ordered on time. Uh, I go out and I look at the shop floor. I look to see if all their machines are running or if they're not because they forgot to order a piece of material or they forgot to get that special ground end mill that no one, someone dropped the ball on. Uh, and then I look at their tool crib. If, if that's crazy disorganized, I know there's a lot of waste there too. How about you, Jason? Okay, same kind of thing. When I walk in, it's to solve a cycle time issue, but I like taking the shop tour and, and the thing that I look for, the thing I hone in on, is big pallets of material next to the machines. 
<clears throat> I love nothing more than walking into a shop and seeing 300 pieces of material sitting on a pallet in front of multiple machines down the line. I'm also keeping an eye out for what kind of part is running there. Is it you know, the dash one running on machine one, then machine two, then machine three. Those are the kind of things that stick out to me and I'm looking for, I'm looking for opportunity there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm right there with you, Jason. Um, you know, I, I think when we go on site, we both kind of look for the, the same things overall. Um, you know, oftentimes when I first visit a shop for the first time, they'll try to force me into the conference room and, and I always ask for a shop tour up front. Um, first and foremost, it's, it's my favorite part of the job, you know, getting to see how things are made. It's just, it's just a lot of fun, but really what I'm looking for is, is this a well-run shop or is it not? Um, so, you know, the first thing that's going to pop out is, are the machines running? Are, are there a bunch of machines that are sitting idle? Um, you know, what is the complexity of the parts? You know, how, how long are the run times? Are they using tool presetters? You know, these are all the kind of things that I'm, I'm picking up. But first and foremost, I'm looking for scrap. I'm, I'm trying to determine are there scrap parts? Um, are there a bunch of parts with red tags on them that, uh, you know, have been flagged um, as not being good? Um, and, and so during this time, it's also a chance to ask a lot of questions that we're going to be able to address at a later time. But, you know, I can find out, you know, are you having issues with machine crashes? Are, are, are machines going down for any, any number of reasons? Um, and then part of that shop tour is always going to end up at some point in the, in the inspection room. Um, you know, they're going to want to show me their fancy CMM equipment. And, um, that's a little bit out of my domain. So I, I guess I'll, I'll push it over to you, Brandon. What do you look for when you visit a shop? Yeah, so I mean, the reoccurring thing is I like to do a shop tour as well. Um, I look for different parts that you guys do, but when I go in, you know, I mainly look and see where there's a bottleneck with these parts. Um, you know, most of the time, is it up like a process or is it at the final end? So I usually look for a stock up of parts, you know, maybe before CMM or after. Why are all these parts failing? Um, I like to see it and look on the machine. If someone's waiting next to the machine, why is it quality related? Those are kind of the things that um, I see a lot of issues with that we can alleviate that process. So I know, Paul, you, you kind of started off with the issues you see at the beginning and you kind of wrap it up at the end. What do you see? Yeah, um, I see people scrambling at final to prepare document packages and get their certs together, get their first article reports in a format that their customer can use. Um, they're often looking at the clock and the UPS drivers coming soon and just trying to get that stuff all prepped and out the door. So that's that's generally what we see at the end of the process. So that was a good, um, a good high level summary. Let's dig into a little bit more detail here. Um, and we're not gonna use slides for this next part. We're just gonna be talking. So when I, at the beginning of course for most shops is the estimating process, right? They, um, they get an RFQ from a customer. Uh, oftentimes they are then pulling out a spreadsheet or maybe heaven forbid, they're just printing off the, the drawing and writing uh, on the drawing, you know, an hour of setup time, 20 minutes of run time, five bucks a piece of material, you know, 10 bucks a piece in anodized or a lot charge. Um, and they're, um, there, those are things that are not going to be easily transferable down the line um, to the next person that needs to take that information if they if they're lucky enough to win that order. So if, if I could just interrupt for a second, you know, you you yeah. mentioned you know cycle times, and it's like how do the estimators actually figure out what those cycle times are going to be? Because you know, obviously, as part of the programming and simulation process, you're going to generate a cycle time that's accurate, but at that point, you've already, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem because you've already now programmed and simulated the entire part that you're just quoting at this stage. Sure. Um, and, and so how do you make sure you get those cycle times right in the quoting stage when you haven't necessarily done the programming yet? Good question. Yeah, I mean, a, a largely, largely that comes down to, I think, quantity. When I was quoting parts uh, at our shop, if it was, you know, a 10 piece order, it, you know, the cycle time wasn't that big of a factor, but if it was a thousand piece order, you bet we would need to get that down, you know, down to, you know, down to seconds or minutes. So we would sometimes have a programmer put some code to the, to that model if we had it. Um, and if that wasn't available or if we weren't going to do that, we would often look uh, at the history of, of similar parts or maybe that part if we'd run it in the past. But that meant finding easy, having easy access to those, to those numbers, which a lot of shops don't have because they have to file through filing cabinets to, you know, find, well, what was the runtime on that part? So um, uh, anyway, so that's, that's hopefully that, that gives some clarity there. Um, 
another thing I look for after that is, and like I said in the intro, I'm looking for piles of, of work order travelers on people's desks. It's amazing how long it can take to even get material ordered or for the programmers to even know there's something to work on if they're relying on a piece of paper to go through the you know order entry contract review process over to purchasing and then finally over to the programming department. Um, and so that's that's a big that's a big opportunity there. Um, but then I know there's lots of waste that are going to happen in the in the programming department. So Jason, why don't you tell us about what you see there? Uh, we don't have waste in programming, but <laughs> but <laughs> but if we did, let's just start. We get a job traveler. Somebody says, Jason, program part one, two, three, four. Most shops that I go into, and I would say easily nine out of ten, every programmer is really highly skilled. They have their own idea though of how they want to program a part. And my favorite is right out the gate, how we're going to design fixturing and how we're going to select what tooling we use. I mean, if programmer A is in love with the NISCAR tool and programmer B is in love with the Sandvik tool, they run and behave differently. So now we're, we're having two different options to start with before we even lay our first bit of tool path. The other problem that I see, another waste I see in uh, programming is running multiple ops across multiple, machine, multiple machines because we're just already setting up the operators for failure. If we have the ability to run something in a five axis and mill complete with tab offs, that's great. But, but what if we don't have that, right? If we're going to go from op one to op two and op three, a lot of the times the programmers already set the guys on the floor up by having three different individual fixtures running across three different machines instead of taking advantage of multiple fixtures on one plug and play fixture that goes inside of a machine. Um, from a programming standpoint, it's a little bit more work on our end but then we're eliminating waste downstream by introducing scrap and error into that. Um, and lastly, when it comes to programming, um, I noticed that the lot sizes really make a difference. If, if we're told to program for, like you mentioned, only 10 parts, we would program it with a, a simple approach, a very quick and dirty get it done. But if we're gonna run a thousand, like you're saying, everything has to be dialed into the absolute T. But the real waste is, do we need to run a thousand at a time? Most of the time, the orders we get are simply to satisfy a batch of 40 per month. Why are we running 300 at a time? And the, the answer is always, well, it's cheaper to run multiple lots in one batch and do it as one batch. But the waste downstream is really, we're not able to have flexibility. So as programmers, a lot of the waste that's getting introduced downstream and is starting with us is pushing back, reducing lot size and just getting more efficient with our setups. But so no matter what, you program the job, uh, it's finally done. You may or may not have set of notes we have to create. But um, as a programmer, I finish my job, it's beautiful, right? And then I throw it over the fence and the guy on the floor gets it. And then I just hope that it, hope it goes well. Yep, and then that machinist is gonna go root through the, uh, the tooling drawer, right? Something like this. Have you seen <laughs> these kind of things in the shop before? I've worked at that shop. No, that's exactly how. <laughs> that's exactly how it is, me, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, yes, for sure. It, when when setups come out on the floor, one of the biggest ways that we see is that there's not enough systems, um, like really good description of this exact tool it's, instead of just like a half inch end mill with a you know quarter inch round. Um, that would be a ball mill, wouldn't it? Um, but uh, but really not having everything prepped for the machine when you go to do that setup. You know, oftentimes we see someone walk to a machine with their job traveler, they start looking at the details and then they leave their machine again to go get something, right? And that's just downtime, spindles not cutting, you're not making parts. Um, once they finally do get everything and get their code into the machine, then comes out that prove out time. So Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that process has, is like? Yeah, and that's something we hear from managers all the time, you know, especially a manager that hasn't been a machinist or, or a programmer themselves. Um, they're, they're often asking, you know, why does it take so long? Why can it take a week to prove out a job that's going to actually run for 45 minutes? You know, but regardless of whether or not you're running one or, or a thousand, you know, you still have that unproven NC code the first time that you've got to now figure out are, is something bad going to happen on the machine or not. So. So what happens? You know, the, the operator gets that NC code and they're going to single step through each individual line of code or they're going to turn the feed rates way down or they're going to do something to make sure that nothing bad is going to happen on this unproven code. If anything doesn't look right or if something bad does happen, they're going to stop the machine immediately and they're going to go interrupt the NC programmer and they're going to try to you know, figure out what the problem was, reprogram that section, 
repost it, send it back out to the job, and you just have this loop that just goes back and back and forth. Um, and that's what can eat up just so much time. Um, so, you know, obviously the reason I'm here is that there is, there is a virtual environment that you can do that in. You don't have to do it all on the actual physical machine. Um, but once you finally do have, you know, proven code and you're ready to make production parts, you know, that first part, it's going to have to go to inspection. Um, and that's, and that's where it's going to go over to, uh, to, to, to Brandon's realm, if you will. Right, right. And, you, you know, I see a lot of problems and mainly on how, when, and, you know, what's the final result of that part. If I, you know, see a whole bunch of red tags on the part, hey, it failed. Okay, why? You know, was there in-process inspection? Um, were, were they taking something? Where, did they take the part from the machine, take it to the CMM? Or, you know, what other ways are they doing that in-process inspection? So, you know, a lot of times I see a, someone at a machine, they're waiting, they take a part to the CMM. It's downtime on the machine. You know, it could take 30 minutes, two hours, three hours. It just depends on the complexity of the part because they're waiting for a CMM to do that inspection. So I see a lot of shops where they don't incorporate ways to do inspection on the machine. And then that there's also um, ways to automate that. So um, we, we look at a lot of uh, CMM rooms, there's you know, three, four, or five employees. Um, are they all doing the most efficient job that they possibly can? We see a lot of times where, hey, one person's in the corner, that's their one job, that's the only thing that they are designed to do. Well, what if that person leaves or what if they call in sick? Is everybody cross-trained? And that's one of the big things that I see, especially it's not everyone's cross-trained and no one's on the same unified software platform or efficient process. I see two, three CMMs in a room. Um, a lot of times they're running different software. They got them at different times, you know, and the process of that company or the history of that company. And they never took the time to unify something. So let's say a CMM goes down. Okay, how are we gonna fix that? Uh, are we going to wait a week or two for someone to come on site and fix that? Or is that person, you know, on vacation? We want to basically minimize that um, process as much as possible. And so ultimately unifying something on all uh, platforms is, is only the way to go. But I mean, after like a roundabout way of getting to uh, inspection apart, Paul, what do, you, what do you see? Yeah. So once you got your part, once you do have it bought off and you finished your, finished your job, um, I mean, at the end of the process, uh, I see a lot of scrambling in getting, sh getting stuff ready. So like I said earlier, you know, there's often a paper traveler, you know, showing up at the final inspection department or the shipping department, you know, they're needing to pull, you know, um, some paper forms maybe and, and, um, enter that into a spreadsheet or some kind of format that they want to send to their customer. Uh, if they need to have certs, which is usually the case uh, in aerospace and other industries like that, they're either, you know, again, pulling them out of filing cabinets, going on their network folder, searching for, for certs, or heaven forbid the cert was with the traveler that might have gotten lost. They might need to call up their vendor again to get more certs um, so they can prepare that document package. Um, you know, everyone, at least in aerospace that we know and work with in a lot knows that, you know, you're buying the paperwork just as much as you're buying the parts. So you got to have that really smooth. And very often it just isn't the case. So that was a good summary of some of the waste that we've seen. Let's kind of switch gears here and get into some of the future state, what we have seen shops do well or uh, ways to eliminate some of those wastes. And I will start first since I am, uh, we are you know, uh, really involved in the beginning of that process. And if I was to say that there was a theme that we're probably all gonna talk about, it's about standardization, right? Um, making sure that you have well-defined processes that people are well-trained in, they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, you're using templates, uh, you're using, um, you know, pre-configured forms, uh, those things allow you to be more accurate and a lot more quick. Um, and also to not, um, and I'm gonna pull up a slide here, um, to not uh, forget things. So one of the things that we highly recommend in shops is to use checklists, right? Some of the most um, critical things in the world like surgeons and, and pilots use checklists before they do their job. And, and machining is incredibly complex. I would say just as complex as those things. So um, having checklists to uh, make sure that you don't forget to do something. Um, you know, even a, you know, a senior programmer that's been doing his job for 10 years will sometimes forget to do something, 
right? Um, so standardization is really important. And then I can't stress enough the idea of keeping it paperless. Um, if there is a way to, um, you know, get your, your paper travelers, make them digital so that everyone can pull them up on a screen, um, even if it's spreadsheets that are shared, you know, across um, an internal network, that's better than a piece of paper that can easily get lost. So, um, and a lot of also shops, uh, we see a huge advantage to doing more of your planning process up front, right? Just being more proactive, a little bit more um, planning up front, looking at, you know, as soon as you get a job, you know, we used to have in our shop what we called a war room session that very same day or the next day, looking at how we're going to fixture this part. What custom tools do we need? Is the material a long lead time? And we'd kick off, you know, activities to get all those things coming uh, right away. Um, and going paperless again will will solve the problem of waiting. Um, it'll also solve the problem of motion, of having to walk around looking for stuff. Um, and so once once all that sort of in place, uh, then it's start ready to hand it off again to the programming department. Um, you got your material on order, you got your tools on order. What's happening next, Jason? That they can do better. Well. For for my, you know, I'd like to agree with you. I think standardization is is definitely the key to success. When I'm looking at the shop and how it runs, I look at overproduction. I see that being the most important or the biggest waste from my world. Everything everything points to being cheaper and how to make parts faster, but I think missing the dollars and the bottom line dollars is probably the biggest thing. Standardization will allow you to do things like building standard tool lists, building templates for your programming. You know, programmers and most people in the shop look at each part and go, that's a unique part, right? My my phone is different than my watch. I'll program it two different ways, program it two different ways. But the reality is you can take the same kind of material and apply the same basic principles to it and get through a program much faster, right? The programming is usually not something you get paid for. It's producing the part, right? Adding value into the piece of material. So if you can come up with a standard header for your programs, use standard tool lists, have uh, standardizing for your roughing and finishing so the guy on the floor doesn't have to wonder what's going to be happening. You know, those are huge things from a programming standpoint. Um, reducing the lot sizes, I think one of the things that people can walk away from is, you know, learning or understanding one piece flow. You know, most people on the call have already taken some kind of lean class or, or read a book on lean, right? I mean, we all have. Uh, one piece flow doesn't work in my shop. Okay, it does work in most cases, but it's the principle of reducing lot sizes down to as small as possible will expose waste. From a programming standpoint, learning and programming and implementing uh, standard plug and play tooling is gonna be critical. Most people like to run big long batches because it means you don't have to incorporate that setup time. If it takes four hours to set up every time you run a job, you'd rather run six months worth of parts and only have one four hour block, but if you reduce your setup to only five minutes, by doing good tooling in the beginning. Then when you get that hot AOG job or somebody comes to you with an opportunity to make really great money, you don't have that machine or that resource tied up for weeks on end running parts. You're able to slip that in and it's gonna cost you a five or a 10 or a 15 minute setup. But it really all boils down to standardization. So to, to, to finish with what you were saying, you know, Paul, checklists. I'm not a fan of checklists because it means more work on my part and I am lazy. However, going through, did I use standard tools? Did I use standard plug and play fixturing? Did I use a header? Did I have my tools, my posts, everything dialed in so that you can't distinguish one person from another? That is absolutely huge. Well, and, and just to make a couple of comments on a few of the points you're making, I completely agree about the standardization. You know, the more you do up front, you know, even if it's in the programming stage, that's going to help you downstream and all the other processes downstream. So, you know, having a standard tool library that you pull from every time, you know, that's going to benefit you both in programming and simulation. Um, you know, having standard, what we, you know, buzzword these days is digital twin, but, you know, having template files for each of your virtual machines, you know, and having those as, as just standard things that people don't mess with that you start from each time that's gonna that's gonna help you out and then with regards to reducing the number of setups you know absolutely and 
um, if you have a virtual environment that you can experiment with, you can test out a bunch of different scenarios. So yeah, maybe you want to take this job that's been running in a three up, you know, kind of thing, and you want to run it and try to do it in one up on a five axis machine. You can test all of that in the virtual environment, you know, or maybe the five axis machine isn't available and you need to run it on multiple ops. Well, you can test out all those different scenarios, get cycle times, be able to predict, you know, what's going to happen um, based on whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then once you have a process locked in, you can take it a step further and start looking at you know, other technology like feed rate optimization. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, we're running out of time. I'm trying to be mindful of that. There isn't time to go into how feed rate optimization works. Um, but there is a common misconception that when you start talking about reducing cycle times, it just means I'm going to push the machine harder. Um, which sounds risky, and it, and it would be. And, and so I just want to emphasize that feed rate optimization is not about just pushing the machine harder. It's not about just speeding it up. It's also very much about slowing it down. It's about maintaining that perfect optimum chip thickness for that given tool at any given point. Um, and then I guess the, the final point I kind of want to make is, you know, and it falls in line with the standardization, is it's capturing that tribal knowledge that your shop has, you know, before it leaves. Um, within Boeing, they've been talking about for years, you know, for many, many years, they've been talking about the gray tsunami that's coming. And that's just all the experience that's, that's retiring out. And now with, with layoffs on top of that, it's, it's getting even worse. So, you know, you've got to get away from paper like Paul's been stressing. Um, you've got to start documenting some of these processes to, to capture that tribal knowledge. And, and, that, and that includes, you know, feeds and speeds. You know, you, don't, you shouldn't necessarily have to be relying on a machinist that can just hear the machine and know, yeah, okay, this programmer, it came from this programmer, I need to turn it down to 75% because they're over, overly aggressive and this other one is too conservative, I'm going to turn it up to 120%. You know, capture that all of that. That doesn't happen, stuff. Brian. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we've had people tell us that, well, we can't optimize our code because the operators mess with the feed rates anyways, you know, and, and that, that really shouldn't be happening because, you know, that knowledge is going to disappear at some point. You need to capture it. Um, so, you know, I guess, Brandon, it, 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 how do you capture that tribal knowledge on the inspection? Yeah, side? oh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I see that in every shop. And again, it's in every facet of, you know, the process from start to finish. But, you know, in the CMM world, Again, I know I mentioned, you know, some companies have two to three CMMs. Yeah, there's that one CMM that goes down. Uh, what happens? Again, the solution is unify that software. I mean, Paul just pulled up this picture. You see a manual CMM. Um, you look at that archaic screen. People are still using that. It's 2020. I mean, uh, it's a great CMM. It's accurate. However, you know, there's nothing we can do to upgrade that. Um, so upgrade to a software, which is totally possible that maybe those two other CNC controlled CMMs can also run. Um, but unifying that same software, let's just say that kind of flows into in process inspection, which kind of steps back a little bit before, you know, it gets to the final inspection. But again, to kind of reduce the amount of waste that you guys scrap, basically you can have that same file that's on a CNC CMM, manual CMM, you can have that on the same arm. So this is an arm that you can bring to the CNC machine. So instead of wasting the time of, hey, maybe you guys are doing in-process inspection, and that's great, what you could do is you can bring the CMM to the machine, mount it in, so therefore you don't have any time wasted, you know, moving that part, or um, let's say you moved the part to the CMM, came back, you wasted maybe a couple hours. What if you realign wrong, or incorrect, if you scrapped that whole part? So Bringing the CMM to the CNC machine is a huge, huge save time bonus. And with that, I mean, there's a bunch of different tools out there that, you know, people are using and some are, you know, are using great, but a lot of people are using in the wrong fashion. Um, maybe they're not accurate enough for that part, you know? So basically what I go in, you know, when I go into machine shop is make sure, that, hey, you're using the right thing. Uh, scanners are huge right now. And I would say that some people are using them incorrectly. So if they send a part, hey, it passes on their end, it goes to a customer, they do on-site inspection, it comes back, fail. How much does that cost you? One, you have to remake all your parts. You could potentially lose that customer all in the same shop. So um, basically upgrading everything, unifying, cross-training your whole platform. We see, uh, Jason, I mean, we've had a lot of successes with some uh, some of our mutual customers where the, C or the, C the CAM programmers are programming the CMM. Um, so if you have that same interface, oh, it just alleviates so much time downstream and saves a lot of money. So with that, I mean, Paul, what's, what's the cherry on top that you see? 
Yeah. So yeah, that's great stuff, guys. Um, again, when it comes down to kind of the end of the process again, um, having, again, stressing that same theme of having systems, right? Making sure, uh, you know, every customer requires different paperwork, different kind of forms. Some need an AS9102, some don't. Um, some want a CFC that's special to them, right? Document everything that your customer wants along with those good parts you're making and make sure it's a system. Uh, everyone knows what they're supposed to be providing. Uh, it's There's not that tribal knowledge that, uh, that you know, hey, this guy knows what kind of form this customer wants. Um, and then as you ship that job out the door, um, make sure everything that went into that is well documented and not, you know, uh, not that tribal knowledge, right? Make sure it's 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 in your system, all your setup notes, your tools that you used, your feeds and speeds, you know, everything is all kind of packaged up nicely. So the next time you get that job, or if you get a similar part, you can just pull that up in an instant, check it all out, and know exactly what you're doing. So I think that's about uh, up for our time. Um, we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A. And there have been some that have been coming in during this time. So if you haven't put any in yet, go ahead and do that. Um, but we're going to start here. Um, uh, let's see, the first one here. Uh, Brandon, what equipment does Verisurf work with? Uh, we work, I mean, I, I mentioned at the very beginning, I work with over 150 devices. But really, we're a third-party metrology software. I mean, we do reverse engineering, but for inspection-wise, we work with CMMs that can measure things very, very small. We work with 3D scanners, and then we also work with things that can measure a whole airplane or a SpaceX rocket. Uh, we do with everything across the board. Um, so, and as far as that goes, you know, what type of equipment, let's say the CMM, we have a whole bunch of different options. You know, there's, there's Mitotoyo, there's Zeiss, there's um, Wenzel. So what we can do is we can interface with all those without a retrofit. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great, easy way to save money and get, again, the same unified software platform that I was discussing. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see here. Um, this one probably for you, Brian. What does it take to set up a simulator? Good question. I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny that that is probably the number one question. Back when we could attend trade shows, that was probably the number one question that people would ask when they would come into the booth is, you know, that all looks great, but how much work is it to set up? And it's an, it's an understandable question. Um, setting up the, the simulation environment is exactly like setting up a real machine. Um, you need NC code, you need some tools, you need fixtures, you need a stock model, and you need a virtual machine and, and control configuration. Um, the control is probably the trickiest part because that's what's gonna be reading and interpreting the GNM codes, the same exact codes that are gonna be processed on the physical machine. Um, but most of those components that I just described, you're also gonna be defining in your CAM system. So for example, if you're using MasterCAM, you've already you've already got, you know, and we talked about standard tool libraries and stuff, but you've already got your tools, you've defined your stock, you know, all that stuff is already there. And then, it's, and then it's just a matter of using the interface between MasterCam and Veracut to, to push it over. The only additional work from an end user standpoint is to create a single coordinate system that is just saying, here's where I want you to take all this stuff from MasterCam and dump it on this machine on this spot in the table. And so you just use a coordinate system to do that. But it's really just a couple of mouse clicks and then you're simulating. It's just like if you can play a, I'm going to date myself here, but if you can play a VCR, you can, you can play a... <laughs> You play a simulation. Wow, that dude's old. So, <laughs> hey, you know what? Um, there's still a question come in, but I have a question, Brian. You had an experience out of a shop where they used the simulation, the verification as a tool to train other people to get better. Wouldn't it make yeah. sense to share that? Uh, sure, that was actually, it's actually a case study that you could go out to our website and go download. Um, and it was, it was, there's not enough time to go into all the details about what they did, but long story short, they would pile everybody every Friday, they would pile all the NC programmers into the conference room, and then they would use the simulations to show the machining strategies that they decided to use. And so they would all put the work up. And, and it was a chance for them to show off their work. And they knew there weren't gonna be any errors or mistakes in it because they've already verified it you know, with our software. Um, but it was, it was a learning tool because the more experienced programmers could say, well, why did you do that operation before that operation? Or why did you do the engraving there when you could have saved it for, you know, the other, you know, whatever. Um, but the shop owner, even though, you know, there's obviously a cost associated with that when you're going to you know, put a bunch of labor in a room at, at one time. 
but he just saw it as incredibly invaluable um, as a way to get the less experienced programmers up to speed quickly because you had the more experienced ones looking right at what they were doing and saying, hey, I would have done it this way. So, um, you know, that's cool. There's more to that story. But so if you want to if you want to hear the whole story and how that went down, because you can <laughs> you can certainly just contact me. Sounds good. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a question here. I guess this is for you, Jason. Maybe we can talk about it together. Um, uh -oh. uh, is it realistic to do, I mean, or a little skepticism here, is it realistic to do one piece flow in a job shop? Like that seems crazy. Um, and I'll, I'll, let me chime in here for a second. Um, sure. So it is absolutely possible. In our, in our shop, we went, we, at first, when we first started our shop, we were batch kings. Like we had, we'd get an order for a thousand parts that had four ops. We would make all thousand parts on op one. Then we'd set, break the machine down, set it up for all thousand parts on op two and so on and so forth. And it's, you know, we thought that was the way to go because it minimized your setup time. Uh, it was just a bit, we thought that was efficient, but we didn't realize until we went through a pretty significant lean transformation that there was huge amounts of waste. I mean, there would have been times where, you know, uh, partway through that run of a thousand, you know, the tool started going bad. We weren't doing a good enough in-process check and we scrapped out 500 of those parts, right? And you don't realize that until later, maybe you're in a second operation or the final operation and you're finally creating the other surface so you could measure that first one and then you realize it's bad and there's nothing you can do about it. So we actually went through um, a pretty significant lean journey and we, we developed this process that we called bar to box. Um, and what we what that actually meant was that we would have a small little right sized bandsaw like tiny little bandsaw right next to the machine and each machinist as they're making parts they would cut that raw material they'd put it in the machine um, or more or multiple, multiple machines sometimes but they you know let's say there was three work holdings we'd flip it across three different fixtures in the machine every cycle a finished part came out and one new piece of material went in then we would do our in-process inspection, we would do deburring, we'd wash or clean it, and we'd put it in the bubble bag, ready to go in the box, out to the customer or out to outside processing. So every cycle from the bar right to the box. And we did almost every job that way, unless it was logistically impossible with size, for example. Um, but it is definitely possible, and there's a huge amount uh, of opportunities to, I mean, for example, you get a customer that has a hot order, they, they start wanting partials right away, you can start shipping partials, you know, on day one, rather than shipping, waiting for a whole week or more before you have your finally good part out. So what about you, Jason? You've any other answers for that one? Yeah, I mean, from what, from my background, one piece flow, is it possible? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, lean isn't just, uh, okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and read a book. We're going to, you know, highlight toilet away until we're, you know, ready to rock and roll. It's, it, it's, it's the goal in mind. You know, sometimes it doesn't make sense to run one piece all the way through a process, but the idea of you're running a little bit, you're checking, you're running a little bit, you're checking, it gives you flexibility. So even if you're just a job shop and you're, you're getting a PO for, for 200 parts, you know, there's always that conversation back with the customer. Do you really need 200 parts or do you really just need 40 a month? So I think there's a little bit of a trust, you know, if you're tier two and the tier one is giving you the job and they're saying, give me six months worth of parts at one shot, there might be a negotiation back. Let me go ahead and do one month worth of parts. So there's a little bit of a communication there. But even if they say, no, we want all six months, the idea of one piece flow allows you that flexibility like we're talking about with getting a hot job. I mean, Paul, you were at your shop and if somebody came in, as it's fantasy, right? But it happens often enough. I'll give you a million dollars if you can crank out this hot job and you got a week to do it. What a bummer it would be if you're 400 parts into a thousand part order and then you're paying guys through the nights and through the weekend to hurry up and get it done so you can get the next job. So sure. the theory of one piece flow where everything is fluid and everything can be adjusted, I think is critical. It's not just a, is it possible? It's, it's a necessity. You have to get your shop to the point where one piece flow is as close to possible so you have the maneuverability to take more money when it's available to you. That's great. And this kind of feeds us into the next question. This is from Chad. He says, many shops are aware of the need to reduce waste, but are disconnected from the pursuit due to lack of manpower. 
what would we suggest to build better standardization and programming tooling simulations and inspection planning? Um, it's a good Can question. I? Yeah. So, Paul, if I could, if you don't mind, I'd like to take just the very first part of that. Sure, Many shops are aware of the need to remove reduce waste, but are disconnected from the pursuit due to lack of manpower. I've worked at a shop that only had 15 guys in the whole entire company, and all 15 guys were versed and trained with basic lean implementation tools. So even if you were just a three or a five man shop, you know, getting by, there's no reason not to expose everybody to a lean thinking and a lean process, and then making your, your employees responsible for coming up with the ideas to implement them. It doesn't have to be a, I'm the manager, I'm the king, I'm the boss, and you all do what I say. A lot of that principle of lean is it should be given the tools to the group, and then they should be the ones moving it upstream. So if you have a, a lack of manpower, well, that's great. Getting everybody cross-trained and getting everybody, you know, learned up, if you will, on lean thinking is, is step one. So go mm -hmm. buy Lean Thinking by James Womack, make everybody read it four times, and let's have a conversation about what are some of the basics we see right now that we could do to improve in our shop. Well, and yeah, and I, I think you're making some really good points. Um, but when it comes to reducing waste, you have to be able to recognize it to begin with. And, you know, we see a lot of shops out there that have this mentality of, well, we've always done it this way. And they, they don't even recognize the waste to begin with. You know, I used the example earlier of the managers that complain about prove out time. So my, my next question is naturally, OK, well, what percentage of your machining time is spent on new prove outs? A lot. You know, it's, it's not even tracked. It's just, you know, that's it's just a cost of doing business. We just have to go through that process. And they, they can't even tell me how much time is spent. So um, until you start tracking that stuff and recognizing it, you can't really start chipping away at it. Um, so I, I think that's a really good, you know, multi-part question there that we could probably mm -hmm. spend two hours diving into. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from the inspection side for Chad's question, I mean, there's a few different ways that you could do it. So, I mean, let's just say you have one person in quality or two people in quality. Uh, there's ways to automate that process. So, I mean, yeah, depending on what tool you're using to inspect that part, um, usually inspecting it's the quick part. The reporting side is what takes a long time where you have to input the tolerances, you have to create a plan. What if that's all automated? So maybe if you run this part maybe 10, 20 times, you can follow a sequential plan, or let's just say one person's a little bit more advanced than the other. You could basically say, have that advanced person write out this plan. They don't need to understand GD&T. They don't need to understand the tolerances. All they have to do is just follow these simple guidelines on where to touch off on the part, and then it will create a nice, clean report that can be sent to the customer in an automated fashion, and that's what we see a lot. I'll add something I hopefully is a little bit practical, um, not that those weren't, but in our shop, talking about sort of lean lean um, education. So we put up posters all over the place of the various, you know, like seven wastes of the Toyota production system. And we had training sessions during some of our, you know, company meetings about, about what those wastes were. Um, and we sort of drilled it into our employees' heads enough that they started to recognize what, when they were doing something wasteful, right? Um, before you understand those, it's hard to kind of put it together, but once you really have it drilled in, and then what they would do is we would have these little Kaizen newspapers, um, basically just a, a, a sheet of paper um, or a pad mounted into each area, and people would just go right over to that and say, I'm, I'm doing overproduction right now, right? Just write down what they were doing, um, only took a minute or two, and then once a week, a team in that department whether it was you know, the programming department or the mill department or the prototype department, or even up in the office. Um, we would have these Kaizen meetings uh, for like 30 minutes once a week, and we would identify, we'd look at everything that was written over that week, um, and we'd just start coming up with solutions. Well, how are we gonna solve this overproduction or this waiting time? Um, and a lot of times the solutions are pretty simple. You just gotta put your collective brain power to it, and you can come up with some pretty good stuff. So that's something that worked well for us. Hopefully that's useful. Thanks for your and question, Chad. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say there's there's a lot of technologies that have been coming online too. You know, I don't even think that are offered by us, but you know, these machine monitoring you know capabilities and and even the machine tool builders have been building this capability into the controls, even though there aren't that many shops that are utilizing it yet. But knowing that it's coming. Um, you know, and once you start monitoring all these processes and and can document it. 
you know, again, you can start chipping away at, at the inefficient processes. And so, you know, I, I just I encourage everybody to be constantly going out and looking at the technology that's available out there, because if, if you don't do it, your competitors are. And if you want to be in business in the long term, you're going to have to stay ahead of the game, which means investigating the latest technologies that are available. Um, another trend that we're seeing, and, and I think this applies to all four of us here, is software being available as, on a subscription. And there's pros and cons of that, obviously, and it's, it's a different ROI for any given shop. But it is a, a lower cost point to get into a technology. So if you really just want to test it, you know, that, that's a good kind of non-committal way to do it. Um, so again, I just want to stress that, you know, st stay out there, keep, keep looking, um, keep looking at what's coming. Yep. So, um, hey, Paul. Yes. So do you mind if I jump in? I had a question. I want to put course. everybody on the spot. Absolutely. Man. I really want Go to. It, man. We got so many questions, but I was noticing that some of them are the same one, just worded differently. Um, what if I don't think I could afford to be lean? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's, that's one of the ways that those worded. Another way is um, a small shop. I can't afford to stop everybody to do Kaizen's. Um, you know, I don't have enough guys. We're supposed to stop every Friday for an hour to cover lean practices. I mean, does anybody have something they could say to somebody who's afraid of the cost of, of going lean or to maybe change the status quo and switch over to something new? Um. I mean, I've thought of it. I can answer it first if you guys want me to be the the the, the guinea yeah, pig. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Well, for me, it, as tough as it sounds, I, I don't think everything revolves around having to spend money outright. I mean, there are solutions out there that have a cost to it, and then a cost to implement it, and then a cost to train somebody. But but really, I think it starts with a desire to improve. If you think you're doing good right now, maybe you are. But I I picture our industry and I picture machining as kind of like walking up the, the sandy slope. If you're standing in place, you inevitably are sliding backwards. Everybody else is making the next step forward. They are progressing. They are using new technology. And, and just because you think you're in a good spot now, if you are not taking steps forward, ultimately you're going to be sitting there at the end going, man, I remember the good old times and, and now, now they're not good. Right? So, don't have the cost well or i don't have millions of dollars to go out and buy brand new equipment or millions of dollars to revamp everything i i think that it starts with uh you know invite one of us in i mean i don't know i up and down washington um i go into people's shops and we have four hour conversations about let's take a look at what's not working i mean i think everybody else in this panel does the same thing to some degree right so yeah. i think step one is before you go out and spend millions of dollars trying to build some space age new revolution machine shop get us in for a conversation let's take a look at what you got going and let's uh let's just do a deep dive and see if you even need to spend any money at all when when i recently mm -hmm. saw your old shop paul one of the things that that stuck uh, that that stood out to me was the fact that almost everything aside from the machines had wheels on it um yep. and that and that you guys had the ability to to push the equipment around for whatever made sense for whatever given job. I mean, that really, that really stood out to me. Yeah. And, you know, and Ryan here is putting in a comment, lean doesn't mean spending a ton of money. It's true. I mean, you know, yeah, we bought some casters, put them on our granite <laughs> tables, put them on our band saws, put them on our vacuum pumps, put them on our hot saws, you know, we'd reconfigure a workstation depending on what job we were running. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, benches made out of two by fours with casters on the bottom. Right. A lot of times we would prototype out someone's, you know, Kaizen idea with duct tape and cardboard. Right. See how it's going to work. Try it out. Don't do something super fancy right off the bat. Don't go buy a bunch of steel, weld up a really custom table and then realize when you start trying to use it. Oh, we forgot about this other thing. Right. So start start cheap, start easy um, and then, the you know, evolve it over time. Um, let's see that, here. That fits in perfectly with what some of the. The questions coming in, you know, a lot of comments along those veins for sure. Yeah, Good from John. Yeah, start small, even if it's just moving a garbage can or a light, uh, you'll feel better along the journey. Yep, that's absolutely true. Um, so there is a question that's been on here. Jonas, want to get to it? It's for me, obviously. How can Pro Shop help companies keep track of their cutting tools? Um, oh, I'll take that one. No, I'm just. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a cutting tool module. 
um, and what we call an RTA module, which is rotating tool assemblies. And essentially, it allows you to first identify your entire tool library, right? And we can um, import that even from like a master cam file in, as CSV data. Um, but, uh, but it allows the programmers to then uniquely specify, right, this A37 end mill, which we buy from GAR, you know, and has these, these specs, is the tool that we use for this job, right? Um, and it has its vendor associated with it and its price. So the way that helps is that when, when, a, when, when the programmer says, this is the set of tools I need, right, that feeds into, into purchasing so they can make sure every one of those tools are going to be there. And they'll even say, you know, this is a steel job or a titanium job, so I'm going to go through a bunch of these. I think I'm going to need 10 of these end mills, right? So everything can be here when the job is to set up. And then out on the shop floor, you can organize your tools by those tool ID numbers, actually. It's actually better than organizing them by style. Um, and, and then the machinists will know exactly what tool to set up in those holders, with what extension length, what kind of collets. Um, so they're not rooting around that, that, that drawer of half-inch end mills, and you have 16 different kinds of half-inch end mill, and they're trying to you know, guess which one the programmer meant. Um, anyway, so that's just a little bit about how we do that. Um, but Paul, I just want to correct you too. Um, the the problem was you're using Gar instead of Sambic. <laughs> That's probably a good point. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, and you can have multiple approved vendors for you know maybe it's a style of tool, right? This kind of coating, this kind of corner radius. Um, thanks, Jonas. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, lots of just positive comments about starting lean. Ryan, two two man shop. We just start organizing. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, well, we're getting we still have a little bit of time. Um, hey, get those questions in before we're done, huh? That's right. That's right. Um, so we can is we it, can keep keep. I'm sorry, we can keep answering questions. But do you want to put the slide up with our contact information in case anybody oh, yeah. just wants to have additional questions offline? Um, people are probably great. sick of staring at our faces anyway, so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I shaved everything right here for people. So, I mean, I, don't know. I feel pretty today. <laughs> but no, I think most, I know most of the people on this call too. And if you forget who's who, uh, don't be shy to reach out. I'll, I'll direct you to the right guy. That's totally fine with me. So yeah, that, oh, that's some good looking dudes right there. <laughs> I need a new picture. That's like 10 years old. I definitely am older than that now. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of comments that are just comments. That's nice, you guys. Thank you. Um, so uh, here's one. Is it realistic to go paperless? Um, it is realistic, and it's totally possible. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of machinists especially are fearful of doing that they like to hold on to that print you know that big b-size print that they can just you know look out up close and sketch things on and write their little notes um and i guess you know i'll say that that's even having that is not necessarily a problem um but we need to provide mechanisms for people to share what needs to be shared down the line uh, with others, right? So programmers, rather than printing off their setup sheets and the paper, um, you know, put them to PDF file and make them available out on the shop floor. Um, we have a page on our website where we talk about shop floor computers, right? They don't have to be super expensive. You can, for 300 bucks, you can be all in on a 24 inch monitor, a computer, keyboard and mouse and a, and a, and a stand for it. You know, and you could pull up PDF files from there. You could pull up spreadsheets from there. Um, or images, you know, um, you know, taking screen captures of uh, of your Mastercam file, even those simulation videos, you know, those I think, right, Brian, you can have those as an executable, so you can just run it and and watch those, right? Um, oh, we did that at my last shop, doing nothing but surfaces. Everybody was able to carry surfaces around from computer to computer, right? So you're saying it's spot on. It should be paperless. Yeah, yeah, um, and then you know, of course, you're going to have to put stuff back in. So having your inspection forms, you know, not be paper-based. Um, so spreadsheets are a great solution for that. Of course, some ERP systems have built-in inspection. Many don't. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's got to be part of the equation too. But it's definitely possible. 
um, and and uh, and the, the the improvements that you can see on that, the, the return on investment of getting rid of paper is enormous. You know, not just the cost of the paper and the cost of those expensive printers, but all the waste that's associated with that. All right. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, can we get a temp license to test out your software? Hmm. Uh, anyone want to take that one first? I mean, I'll do it, but do it, but I mean, I'll start there if you want. Uh -huh. <laughs> the answer is absolutely not. No. Um, yeah, you can get licenses, but it's uh, it's only as good as the driver uh, was familiar with the machine. I've had the pleasure to try driving a Lamborghini before and stall it out about 30 times before I even got out of proof <laughs> gear. And that's where, uh, that's really, from my standpoint, that's where who you choose to partner with makes all the difference. I know for our company, sure, I can get you a license, but I insist on hand-holding and making sure you know what you're doing, getting you up and going. And then if you want to take off and, and see what, you know, see what it can do, be my guest. But, but we absolutely insist on working with you step-by-step step to make sure that it's successful. I mean, same and, with and you, Brian. Yeah, that's always our concern as well, is, is the, you know, the training factor. Um, you know, the simulation does not, like I've described earlier, it does not have to be complicated at all. It can be a matter of a couple mouse clicks and hitting go. Um, and then there's a bunch of analysis tools available to you. But, you know, this is also a product that's been around for 32 years. And, you know, we have to support the most complex CNC machinery in the world. And people do some crazy stuff out there. So if you start just poking around different menus and windows and opening things up very quickly, it can just look overly complicated and then people are like, ah, oh, this is too, too much complication. So that's always the concern about just saying, here, try it out, um, without providing some kind of training along with it to say, here's how you're going to step it through it with your process. So that's just something we would want to address for sure. Right. Yeah, likewise, same thing. It's just a recipe for disaster if we just give you a license and don't hold your hand. But we will. Um, I'll come on site, you know, depending where you're at, with code restrictions, I understand, or, you know, we can do a go-to meeting or a web demo like this yeah we'll, we'll we'll be here to assist you anyway so yeah and same with same exact for us we have we have demo systems that we uh give credentials into to play around with it but we always uh do training sessions up front and typically have the first couple of times where we're just there kind of watching over your shoulder and, and showing you what to do because you know all of these products are super involved super complex um you know, powerful, of course, but that means you gotta you gotta learn it. So you're not stalling out your Lamborghini 30 times. That there are um, very few things as humiliating as thinking you're you're super cool, and then you're gonna show everybody how cool you are, and then uh, I'm not qualified to drive this car. I guess I should have paid better attention to the instructions. It's uh, it's pretty humbling. Yeah, yeah. Um, we probably have time for one more. Um, here's one here, I guess, for you, Jason. How do we? Um, what are some things we can do with our with our programming software to make it more lean or to make our process more lean? Oh boy, you'd make me the last question and tell me I've got 60 seconds to do it, huh? <laughs> okay. What can you do to be more lean? Well, I'll, I'll say this, checklists. Um, they're, they're a real bummer to have to follow a checklist, but there are, if you develop the checklist for programming, did I use the standard tool list or am I reinventing my own every single time? If you have your half inch MLS tool one in this machine, three there, five there, seven there, there's a lot of setup involved going from program to program. So build a standard checklist of use standard tools, use standard fixturing, make the header of my program look the same. If you have a post that doesn't behave the way you want, let's get it fixed. Um, so I think there's a lot of standardization and a lot of uh, focus on plug and play. And then really, even with programming, I mean, the tool paths are one thing, you know, you can learn whatever software you're using, you can learn how to drive that software. Somebody out there will help you. And if you're in, you know, Northwest, I'm the guy. But I think that um, a lot of it has to do with building standard practices and then, you know, being religious about making sure you follow them. I think that's uh, that's a big key. And then feel free to reach out to the uh, the the Mastercam guy, the MLC CAD systems, Jason Cover, the one with the goofy small. Go ahead and uh, you know, make sure you take that email address down and say, I've got a question. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll work with you on that. Yeah, and so Justin uh, has a similar question here. 
He says, uh, we have four programmers and lots of legacy programs and standard tooling. The problem is trying to get standard programming methodologies and feeds and speeds and depths to cut. Is there a decent way to gather all of that legacy information into a standard database? Um, that sounds like a programming question. <laughs> yep, you want it, Paul, or do you want me to do it? No, you go for it. That's you. Oh, man. Okay. So this is my opinion. Now that I've said that, um, I think going back to legacy programs, uh, I just archive them and deal with them as they come up. But let's say job one, two, three, four, we've run a hundred times and now we're implementing these new standards. I would say there's nothing that I've seen that'll just go through a code and say, oh, you've used the half inch ML, 100,000 depth of cuts, 75% step over. I don't see a lot of that. I've never seen software that'll do that. What I, what I encourage people to do is Get, you're going to have a programmer you trust, right? There's a guy that you go, that's the one, you're going to develop my systems. If you're cutting 718 in Inconel and you know that a 5% step over with this ISCAR tool at this depth of cut works, build that as a template in your software so that any time, doesn't matter if you're the superstar programmer or the junior programmer, he's able to bring that tool path in. It's going to have his depth of cut, his step over. It'll even remember speed and feeds, at least in some of the software. I know ours does. So build a template for that specific application for that one tool path. Then when John Doe takes program one, two, three, four from the dark ages to today, and you're going to reprogram it or rerun it, when you see a roughing routine, you know, has just been a problem. Bring in your template for roughing ink canal, or excuse me, roughing 718 ink canal, and then pick that geometry and drag and drop it into the new tool path. And then you'll have applied the new standards to an old way of doing things. I don't think it's necessarily valuable to to go through old legacy program, reprogram from scratch, but if you always have that one roughing routine, it's been crap, no problem. Bring a new process in, reassociate geometry, and then copy and paste it into that section of program. Now you, you, can't, drop, you can drop it into a simulation program and and then you would be able to to gather some of that information. But again, you need the same the same stuff that the machine tool would need. So you you would still need some tools to find. Um, you'd still need to know what machine it was going to be run on. You'd have to have a, a virtual equivalent of that same machine. But then it would. So if you just wanted to take the jobs that you know run really well and you wanted to gather information out of those jobs, you could set up a simulator for just that and you would be able to pull all that feed and speed information, step over, depth of cut, volume of material being removed, all of that stuff would be would be analyzed. So but but it would be I mean if you had a whole bunch of legacy programs, that'd be that'd be a big undertaking. So not an automated yeah, way. There's no doubt. Doubt. There's, yeah, no automated way. Yeah. It's a big undertaking no matter what. But those are good great points you guys. So we do need to wrap up. There's one last question I just wanted to get to. Um, uh, this cups company says they have more than 30 machines, 60,000 square feet. It's a big outlay to go digital um, everywhere. Um, so what I would say about that is, I mean, first of all, look at how 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 little you can actually spend on a device. Um, you know, there are ways using like a Linux, a little Linux box, a Raspberry Pi, you know, where you can probably be up and running for 200 bucks. You know, monitor, keyboard, mouse, computer. Um, or, and then starting with a lower density, right? If you have a, a cell of machines where there's three machines all close to each other, or a couple of lathes facing each other on a bench, right? Just start with one and share that. Um, and then kind of over time, kind of increase your number of your density of devices. Um, or, or if you have, you have a lot, you have fewer people than machines, then just give people, you know, a Chromebook or something like that, that um, is pretty inexpensive and they can just kind of carry it around going to the machines they're working on or some combination of both, so. Anyway, just a couple of tips on that. I do think we need to wrap it up. I know I'm late to another meeting already, but um, thank you everyone for all your time. Um, hopefully this has been useful for you. Uh, thanks for all your great questions. And uh, we will send out the recording for this and uh, follow up email. If you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah, thanks everybody. All right, well, good job you guys. You. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.